presentation, and uh, I'm going to go over uh, just a touch back a little bit on the first three churches that we studied, and we know these to be uh, church ages, as in as in the history since Christ. These are church ages, uh, seven of them, and also we find that these churches are are somewhat typical of many churches today. There's a little element of some of these in a lot of churches. And some of these, there's an element of all of them in, you know, in church. And that, that just makes for, uh, makes for a lot of confusion. Uh, but we find these church ages, and it's actually were, were seven churches scattered abroad, uh, you know, and, and they, as they were uh, different, you know, different churches, different locations, they were churches such as ours only it was back in you know back in time back in the early church but they were seven individual churches and yet God uses these to explain to us the seven different time periods from uh, from his death all the way up to present day and you read the scripture and they're right up in, in line with what has gone on in the church and what is going on in the church today now <clears throat> the first church was the church at Ephesus it was the church of the uh, first century. It was uh, the desirable one. It was the, the early church. Uh, it was founded in the book of Acts. And that early church had a love for the Lord Jesus and began to spread the gospel. The missionary, you know, the, the uh, uh, missionary journeys and all that stemmed out of, uh, out of that church and carried on into, uh, the, the story carries on in into the next church. So, but God said about it, the Lord said about it, you have lost your first love. And what we don't want to do as Christians, lose our first love. We want to stay in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and realize exactly what he has done for us. And then the church of, of Smyrna. Uh, this church was the persecuted church of the second and third centuries. Now, this is when after the church at Ephesus left her first love in that church age, then we find the church of of uh, Smyrna being the persecuted church, and they were uh, persecuted by the Roman emperors, and two of them being Nero and Constantine, and and they had uh, you know they had many uh, many disagreements, many differences, and people were burned at the stake, and people were slaughtered for the gospel's sake, for the for the word of God, and for their testimony. People were were put to death. They were highly persecuted. And trying all the time, the devil just trying to stamp out, uh, stamp out the gospel, but it'll never happen, friend. Uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will carry on. And so we see after this, we see that uh, the church of Pergamos, and that church simply was married to the world. And uh, they, they were a church during the, you know, during the uh, time in which all, everything about them was of works, Everything about them was of good deeds. Everything they did, you know, that's what it, that's what it all come down to, the hierarchy of the church and everything, uh, everything just under uh, the government's control and everything just pointing at man instead of God. And then after that period of time, we enter the church of, of Thyatira. And in this church, uh, we see it's the church of the Dark Ages. And it runs from uh, 500 A.D. to... To the 16th century. Now, that's a long period of time in which the, the word of God was very much neglected. Uh, the word of God was, was uh, it was corrupted in the teaching that it was, but God preserved his word even through this time. Now the only way they had of preserving the word of God then was for them to, you know, to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And they had no print press. They had no way to do that. And so they would, they would hand write the word of God that, that they had at that time. They would hand write that and pass it on. And God preserved it without any contradiction or any error. I'm amazed at the word of God. Now, that it would be, uh, you know, not common folks like you and I would not, have, would not be able to have a Bible. Uh, it would, would not be commonplace for us to have a Bible because they had no way of, of, uh, of reprinting except by hand. And so there were very few of those, and then uh, no, uh, you know, not, the, of course, through the whole time frame now, there's a remnant of people that are staying with the Lord and staying close to him and keeping the precepts, 
and keeping the Word of God, but as a whole, it was generally neglected and, and the Word of God had gotten corrupted as far as man was concerned, but that remnant had still had the true Word and still had the, uh, the uh, zeal to carry it on. And you see that through every church age, the zeal to carry on the gospel. And then it, it, was, it was a, the word Thyatira means a continual sacrifice. And that's what it was, is a continual sacrifice of things that they could do to earn their way to God. And you, if you studied anything about medieval history, uh, that's, what, that's the period of time that we're talking about. And we know of the corruption. We know of, the, of the, the politics of the time and all that that went on. But the word of God's corrupted, and it goes from a doctrine of grace to a false doctrine of works and ceremonies and sacrifice and pagan worship. Now, the, the word of God tells us here that it will be, that Thyatira will be cast into the great tribulation. Now, all those that are of that, of that church will be cast into the great tribulation. Does that mean those that are there? Yeah, but that means what that means is those that are in this time frame, in the church age we're in, but carrying on those same doctrines and carrying on those same, uh, you know, those same traditions. In, in uh, chapter number 2, verse number 18, let's read a few verses right there. Chapter number 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And this is a perfect illustration of the Lord Jesus. He's walking in the midst of the candlesticks, which are the seven churches. Verse 19, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Now, what's he talking about here? He says, I know of your patience. I know of your works. I know of your charity. I know of your faith and your service and, I, and thy works. He says, and I know that your works are greater than those other things that I know about you. And so it become a, a religion of works. Religious, had, religious as it was, it was, it was a religion of work. Not, verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, prophetess, to teach and to, to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to the idols. Now what's this about? Jezebel uh, was Ahab's wife. And she is the one that, that uh, caused Ahab to commit idolatry. And so God rightly uses her as an example or as a, you know, as calling what, what it is that the world has, at that time, the world as a whole had been turned over to uh, false doctrine and to worshiping idols. Now, friend, the dark ages of time when, when people were worshiping that way, uh, they would sacrifice children to, to the crocodile. Uh, they would they would burn children on an altar, and I you know there I I've told you this I guess when we were over in Israel, uh, there was a place there uh, called the Gates of Hell. That was that's the name of it. You know we read that the Gates of Hell. The talking about the church, the Bible says the Gates of Hell shall not prevail against it. Well, there is a literal place called the Gates of Hell, and looking off into that dark pit, there in the center of that is a huge boulder. And, and uh, history says that on that boulder was offered human sacrifice because of idolatry, because they thought that would, uh, you know, that would uh, help them to have uh, fine favor with the Lord. But let me tell you something, friend. That's just all a big mess and all a big uh, ploy by the devil, by Satan, to try to disrupt the Word of God and try to disrupt the gospel message and that went on through that period of the dark ages. So we, uh, we see here, let me read on, verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So all those that will hold to that, you know, that way of thinking through the church ages, all those that will hold to that way of of thinking will be cast into the great tribulation of time. So that period of dark ages, when the church went through that dark time, uh, even though it was, you know, per Christians had been persecuted, were continuing to be persecuted, but even during that time, there's always that remnant that came 
through the church of Ephesus and through the church of Smyrna and through the church of Pergamos and now into Thyatira. There's still that, that remnant of people that are going to be faithful to God. And it carries on even until our day. There is that remnant of people. Although a small group they are and they may be, then that there are those that are going to hold true and hold faithful to the word of God and to its promises and to the gospel. And that's what carries on the word of God. That's what carries it on from age to age, from generation to gener generation, is those that will hold to the standards and the, and the principles of God's word. Now what's happened in all these church ages is, is people have gotten away from this. They've gotten away from the, the truth of this book, the word of God. And when you get away from that truth, my friend, there's nothing out there but false doctrine and, and error and, and all those things that go along with it and nothing but a mess. God's people, in order to be right with the Lord, in order to accomplish what he will for us in this life, this church age that we live in, we will follow the word of God. And we will stand upon its principles if we are to, if we are to keep ourselves uh, in, the, in the right place with the Lord we will do it because of the word of God because his word is forever settled in heaven it changes not so we see that in these, this dark age of time when you go back and look at it and you study what went on in the dark ages and uh, it was just a, 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 a time of great trouble and a time when the gospel that's why it's dark because the gospel wasn't being, uh, wasn't being spread as it should but they, but but that remnant began to think for themselves. That remnant began to uh, make a stir and make a racket. And that brings us to the uh, church of, of Sardis, chapter number, uh, chapter number 3 and verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how that hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, there's that remnant. There's that, there's that group of people, that, that small group, though they are, that has come through every age. Here they are. We see them in the, in the church of Sardis. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, this, this remnant, uh, this remnant of people uh, that have come through the dark ages. We, we come to a period of time in this church of Sardis and we call it the, the uh, church of the reform, reform, reformation. Uh, it is, it is a, the church where reform starts to happen and where people begin to understand that the state religion, and uh, I'm not going to get into all that tonight. Maybe I may pick back up on that because it's heavy on my heart. Uh, but, the, but the state religion, had caused so much opposition, and people begin, you know, people begin to uh, see in the Word of God, the, the, you know, and, and be and be taught out of the Scripture, because of of an invention, and that invention came in in 1550, and it came from Germany. If you ever want to be thankful for anything Germany has ever done, Amen, is the Gutenberg press, and so they began to print the Word of God so people could. Well, it was more accessible to them because they were able to print the Scripture. Now, friend, the Word of God is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, but it must be known. It must be read. It must be heard. And so they printed these Bibles, and they were called uh, uh, the... Uh, yeah, it just went right out of my... It was the Bible of 42 lines is what, is what they called it. The Bible of 42 lines because it was a Bible that had only 42 lines on it. But then, as as the reform started, and people began to read the uh, people began to read the Word of God, and they began to see the grace of God, and they began to see that salvation was by grace and not by works. Then that caused a, a reformation to start, and it caused the the faithful that were there to uh, to 
uh, uh, be more faithful. It caused them to prevail over the false doctrine of the world that, that was being presented at that time. Uh, the, the, the Bible that they could read and that they could see began to paint the picture for them of what the truth of the Scripture was. Now, you imagine... You know, it'd, it'd be like someone being out in, in some far away land and all they've ever heard was paganism. All they've ever heard is, is false teaching and uh, idol worship. And then they come to somewhere where they've got a Bible. And they have, with an open mind, they begin to read the Bible. They're, they're, you know, they can read it and they begin to read the Bible. And they begin to see how contradictory to the Word of God as to what they have been taught all their life and what they believed all their life and what they come out of, and they begin to reform. So wait a minute, uh, this is what uh, this is what I you know uh, what I want to believe. This is what I want for my life. So out of this church, out, out of this church came uh, came people like Calvin and uh, Luther, uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Erasmus, and uh, John Knox, and these were all reformers. And these were all that, uh, I believe it was, uh, let's see, I believe it was Martin Luther uh, that he, he wrote his thesis and he pinned it to the, uh, to the door of the, uh, you know, of the, of the synagogue and he pinned it to the door that salvation was by grace and not of works. And so men like that, that, was, that the Holy Spirit of God could, could teach and could speak to their hearts, they began to accept the word of God for what it was and re realize that salvation is a salvation not of works, but of grace. Now, friend, that's still true today. Although we see many people that still adhere to salvation by works, <coughs> but we believe because of the and that can't be proven by Scripture. You cannot prove to me in Scripture that salvation is by works. It's by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible even says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And so as, that, as those begin to uh, reform themselves, then that leads up to another, another great church. And all these reformed preachers, and they, you know, they decided they wanted to come out of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, and they became Protestants. That's where we get Protestants from, is they protested the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And because what do they teach mostly? It's ritual. Uh, it's uh, sacrifice, it's uh, uh, salvation by works and good deeds, and all of, you know, all of those things, that's what it is. And so they saw that that wasn't it. So the Protestants stem from that movement of Reformation. Now, Baptists do not come out of that movement. And we may need to do a study on the history of Baptists. We may do that next. But we do not come out of, out of we're not Protestants. I'm not, I did not protest anything. Uh, but, but, uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin, the Calvinists and the Lutherans, is where they came from. They protested what was going on in the church, and so they, therefore they came out of that. What am I? I'm a Baptist. Uh, from the you know from the beginning of time, you can trace Baptist history all the way back to the time of Christ, and so that thread. But here we find these that decided that that uh, the teaching of the Scripture was more important than man's ideology, and so they reformed and came out. Now, this got some excitement started. The Word of God, you think about it, the Reformation. The Word of God was, was proclaimed. The Word of God was able to be proclaimed. More people had, had uh, access to the Scripture, all because of the press. And so, see, the press in technology is, was a very good invention, would you not say? And so what did preachers do? They began to have a copy of the Bible. They began to print more. And so it was a good invention. But as time went on, we see the press has been used for all kinds of of literature, bad, good, ugly, but it's been used for all kinds of things. The problem is not with the invention of the press. The problem is with the use of it as some people have used the press. And so it's used not only to spread the truth through the gospel, but it's also used to, to spread uh, much propaganda and much false teaching and much false doctrine. But I'm still glad we got the printed word of God that came out of that time of Reformation. Now, uh, also, uh, during that same time period as, as that went on, later on in, you know, later on more technology, uh, later on in the church age, uh, more technology became available. 
The radio was invented. Electricity come along. And not only could people preach uh, to hundreds, maybe at a tent revival, or preach in their church, but they, they could also, by radio, they could get the message out to far more people. Now, friend, I'm all for technology used in the right way. Now, we know radio's been used for many wrong things, to broadcast uh, many lies, to broadcast much deceit, uh, to broadcast much sin. But the technology of radio has been good for the spreading of the gospel. Then came along the TV. Then came along the Internet. All of these things, if used in the right way, are good to carry out the gospel. And yet, through it all, there will always be that corruption that goes along with it. But when we use technology here at the church, we want to use it for the purpose of not spreading our name, but for the purpose of spreading the gospel. So that all started during the Reformation with the printing of the, of the Gutenberg or the, or the printing press. And so in next, that brings us to a, the uh, next to the last church in the seven churches, which is the church of Philadelphia. Uh, verse number seven of chapter three, and the angel, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I'm talking about a door here. If God opens a door, nobody can shut it. If God shuts a door, nobody can open it. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Now. Pay attention to what an open door is. And when you, when you come to the church, if that, if that door is locked, you have not access unless you've got a key to get into the church. But if that door is open, you've got access to everything in here because of an open door. Now, he's, we're talking, he's talking here about, about an open door that no man can shut, uh, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Who is he talking about? That remnant of people that have come through that church that have kept the word, that have kept the faith. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. Now, who is this? Had someone ask me, who, what does that verse mean? Those that are uh, say they are Jews and they are not. They were people that blended right in with the Jewish tradition and with the, uh, with the Jewish ceremony, with the Jewish rites, but they were not Jews. He, that's, that's exactly who these people were. Uh, and are not, but, but do lie because they say they're Jews and they're not. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, uh, which is new, Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what God's saying to this church of Philadelphia. Now, this church of Philadelphia was an open door, and that is the church of the 19th century. And you go back and read, uh, the history of that period in church history of that period and you will see a great revival is the church of revival it's the 19th century preaching of the word of God to, to vast numbers of people that are willing to hear the word of God that are eager to hear the preaching of the word of God and why are they eager to hear the preaching of the word of God because God has, has given man the, the power of the Holy Spirit of God to preach the word of God and because of the power of the preaching of the word of God, people are getting saved. Mass revival has broken out in the land. And, the, and, and you know, in, as a, well as, a, as it was, the world as a whole was experiencing great revival of the scripture, of the word of God. Many people were getting saved. And so uh, as that was going on, we know that throughout, throughout the great preaching and the great revivals that were going on, there came names associated with these uh, of of uh, Whitfield and John Wesley and uh, uh, John Edwards and Moody and Spurgeon. John Edwards, that wasn't right. What was his name? What was his name? Gone by. But, but, but you remember when I tell you the next time. Uh, but Edwards and, and uh, Moody and Spurgeon, all of these were great preachers of that day. 
And they all spread the gospel, and they would, you know, they would preach to thousands. And yeah, Jonathan Edwards, as, as he preached that great message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he preached that message, and, and, and people were, were holding on to the, to the pillars of the building because they were, it was preached in such the power of God that they were afraid they were going to fall into hell. Now, that's testimony of that day of preaching. And it is told, and I wasn't there, but it is told that when he preached that message, that uh, he turned his back to the audience because of the light, and he read the message that he wrote. He read it. But under such power of God, people heard the gospel and trembled at the word of God. And friend, preachers today preach their hearts out and preach on heaven and preach on hell. And people don't seem to get it. And, we, you know, people don't have receptive hearts to the word of God that they used to have. And you know that as well as I do, that, that people just don't receive the word like they used to. There's too many other things going on in life, too many other attractions going on in life for people to to grasp a hold of the meaning and of the truth of the word of God preached in power. Now, there, there are some churches that don't know the power of God. There are some churches that have never experienced the power of God. And they don't know what it is. But friend, I'm grateful to be associated with the, with the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. It's the one that gives you power in your day-to-day -day life. It's the one that gives you, uh, you know, victory. And it's the one that helps the preacher preach. And that's what was going on in the 19th century. Great revival spread out. Now, with this great revival that, it, that was uh, going across the land and, and sweeping, you know, sweeping the countries, here's what else was going on. People began to have a burden for missionaries, for those that they could not, you know, those that they could not reach in their homeland. And so they began to have a burden for those in far lands that they couldn't, you know, could not get a hold of and tell them such good news. So they became missionaries and, and started out spreading the gospel because of the story they had to tell was, was worth being told to people they didn't know. And so mission started out as that. And that missionary movement it started with men like, uh, like Livingston and, and Taylor that went into wherever they could go, China, wherever they could go, the deepest uh, jungles of Brazil or the Amazon, wherever they could go, spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So missions had its start, or its good start. Paul started in, in uh, his missionary journeys, but missions had a great revival in that day. And that brings us to the last church that we'll talk to you about Tonight, and that is the church of the Laodicean age. And that is the church that in that's began with the, with the closing of the church of Philadelphia. With that closing, there was that open door for a space of time. When we read here about an open door, there was that, that uh, open door for a space of time in that which the gospel was able to go out. But you notice today that door is, is, is being shut. That door has been shut, and, and nations that once, you know, uh, once wanted the gospel are no longer wanting the gospel. Now God's opening up other doors. Uh, places like the Philippines are open to the gospel right now in, uh, you know, in more ways than ever before. And so the gospel, where it can be preached, if, if churches such as I will help support people that go there and preach the gospel, then certainly uh, we, we do well. And certainly the gospel does well where it is preached. But you look around today, and you know, you don't see, the, I'm sorry, friend, but there's no vast revival going on in, in the United States today. I don't know where in the world vast revival is going on like it used to. And so that door shut, and then this door of the Laodicean church that, ca that has come upon us, it is the church of the end days. And I believe certainly, friend, that that you and I are living in that very church age and we're living at the end of that church age. We're living in the church age of the end and I believe we're close. We're almost to the end of that church age when Jesus could come at any moment. And so all through this, all through this history of time as, as these different churches are portrayed around, you know, around in different local assemblies sometimes, but there's always that remnant whether Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, whatever, Catholic, that are saved in the grace of God that are going to be true to the living word of God. And so we see here in this day that we're living in, the Laodicean church age, we see that, 
Although vast, you know, majority of people don't know God, vast majority of people don't care about God, there are those that still care about God. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. When the end of that church age, when the end of this church age arrives, then you and I are going to go to be with the Lord. That's how this church age is going to end, is with the rapture of the church. And so I, look, you know, I'm glad. It's exciting times for me to be alive, I'll just tell you. Because I know, because of, the, of, of what's going on, according to the word of God, of what's going on, this is a, the, uh, let me read, just let me read a couple of verses. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, verse 14, chapter 3, write these things, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That is the description of the Laodicean church. They're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm. How many of you like to drink lukewarm water? Anybody? You know what it about make me do? It about make me sick. It about make me throw up to drink lukewarm water. Now, I, I, if I'm drinking hot water, I like for it to be in the form of coffee. But I do know people that will get up and drink a cup of hot water every morning. That's what they drink. Nothing in it, just a cup of hot water. And so what God's saying here, he said, I'd rather you be cold or hot than lukewarm. Don't know where you're standing. Listen, people that are cold on God, you know where they stand. They're cold on God. People that are on fire for the Lord and trying their best to serve the Lord and trying their best to do the will of God, you know where they stand. But these people that are just lukewarm, they're straddling the fence, so to speak, and they'll, they'll live apart in the world and part in the church. They're lukewarm, and you can't, you know, I don't want nothing to do with that. But it seems like a, a lot of church people today are living that, just lukewarm, just going along, just, just, just making it, have no strong stand for anything, so they fall for everything. And that is, the, you know, that is the picture of the church as a whole that we see today. Not hot, not cold, but lukewarm. And so as we see that picture of a church, you can look around and see and you can tell that's the, that's the way God's, uh, you know, uh, Christian people, Christianity, uh, Christendom, that's the way that it is beheld today as being neither hot or cold. What did, what did God say he did? He said he'd spew it out of his mouth. So he made sick to his stomach. And so, friend, I want to determine in my life as a believer not to be, not to be lukewarm. And, and even God says, he said, I'd rather you be cold is to be lukewarm. That's what he says right here in Scripture. Because that way at least people know where you stand. At least they know what you are. But, but it, as he goes on here, <clears throat> Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Well, what's that saying? Because people have got everything they need, they don't know they're, they're, they're lost. They don't know they're blind and naked and diseased and corrupt because everybody's got what they need. Not many people, listen, not many people are in want today. Now, on the way over here from church, I, I stopped at McDonald's to get something to drink. And uh, I stopped there, and, and as I was going in, I noticed a... A lady or a female standing outside uh, at the at the uh, uh, red light, and she was holding up a sign. And of course, people were giving her money. And I thought, you know, wonder, just wonder how, just wonder what's going on here. So I drove on up to McDonald's. I got my drink, and I was sitting there in the car, starting to leave. And I, she came up to the bank, up to McDonald's, and they had a uh, not a not a bad looking SUV. They were driving. And there was another fellow there. He grabbed the sign, and he went down there, and he began to stand for a while. And I kept watching that, and I drove out and drove down there, and he was standing there, and he had the same sign. Guess what they had on the front of that sign? A cross. Using the cross as a, you know, as a, as a give me some money. And they had a cross that said, need work. Well, he looked like he's doing pretty well to me. But, you know, it is this day that we're living in. It is this society that we're living in where people don't know. They don't know, and, and, and seemingly they don't care what shape the world is in. Even though they, were, they seemed to be poor, it seemed like they had what they needed. 
And, you know, we, we drive nice cars. Most of us drive, a, drive a, a, a car of transportation. Gets us back and forth. We, we, most everybody's got a, uh, at least a, a one television, got a microwave, got everything we need. People don't need God anymore. They do need God. I know that. You know that. But they don't understand people because of our riches and because of the wealth of our nation in particular. People don't need God. What do, they need? what do they need him for? Because they've got everything they want. They don't think they need God. But they need him worse than ever. People need the Lord just as bad as they've ever needed the Lord. How do you get through to folks like that? They don't understand what God can do from God. Listen, I'd rather have Jesus than all the riches of the world. I'd rather be saved and, and, and uh, you know, live in a cave, in a hole in the ground or somewhere than to be lost without God and have everything this world's got to offer. So that is the day. We're living in the Laodicean uh, church age. <clears throat> and as, as we get, you know, get near and near the end of this church age, friend, I'm sorry, but things are not going to get better. Things are going to get worse. Now there, I don't look for a, after studying, you know, I believe God can send revival to our country, to this world, if he wants to, if he desires to, but it's the only way he'll do that if God's people desire him to. If God's people humble themselves before God and seek his face and turn from the wicked ways, then God will send revival. But I'm sorry, I just don't have a whole lot of confidence in that going on because we're living in the last days of time. And I don't see mass revivals. Now, there may be revival break out in different sections of the country, different sections of the county. There may be a revival break out. I still, I still hold to the fact that our church is experiencing uh, some revival. Uh, because of the way God's blessing us. And I believe that. But as a whole, there's not a nationwide revival. And I don't look for it. Now that will disappoint a lot of people, I'm sure. And uh, people won't agree with me. That's fine. I didn't say God couldn't do it. I said I don't look for it because of the lukewarmness of the church as a whole. Now, as, as we read the rest of this chapter. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chase in verse 19. Be zealous therefore, thereof and repent. <clears throat> therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now where is he standing? He says, I stand at the door of, and knock. Where is he at? He's outside the church. There's, that's very significant where he says, I stand at the door and knock, being that Christ is outside the door and he's knocking. And if anybody will let him in, uh, you know, there's churches that have just about all but banned God from their services because they want everything done exactly their way, exactly the way they want it done and, and uh, don't need God to tell them or, or instruct them in a way to do things. And so they're basically what they've done is say, Lord, we don't need you anymore. We'll worship as we please. And so a lot of that worship is far from God and far from uh, what true worship should be. So he's standing at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. If you just answer the door, he'll sup with you. He'll dine with you. And if he's at the door of a heart, standing outside the door of a heart, and that knocking on that door, won't you let me in? I'll save you if you'll let me in. If that person will open the door of their heart and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, he'll come in and he'll dine with him. Amen. So we see here, verse uh, 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This is important. Ends every church age with, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord saith to the church. What's God saying to the church today? He's saying we're living in this last church, the Laodicean church age, a church that is luke, lukewarm, prideful, and self-righteous, uh, self -righteous, and uh, where preachers are preaching a soft gospel or, a, or, a, or soft preaching and don't call sin what it is and don't call, uh, tell people they're going to heaven or hell. That kind of preaching, my friend, is what people want to hear, the soft-spoken word, the, the feel-good preaching. We're in that day. We're there. And, and the next thing, if Christ is on the outside of the door, if we'll just hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to us when he comes, friend, we're going to be in good shape. And Lord, help us that we don't fall into that, 
the state of the Laodicean church. Help us that we stay in that Philadelphian uh, church mentality where we want to spread the word of God, where we want to uh, feel revival in our soul because through every one of these churches there's been a remnant that's going to stay with the Lord and going to stay by God. So, so we see that now. Chapter 4, and, and I'm going to read you one verse here. We find a, uh, you know, the, the closed door at the end of chapter uh, at the end of chapter number 3, we find the closed door because Christ is on the outside knocking. Now the whole thing turns and, and, and takes on a whole, new, a whole new turn right here in chapter 4 and verse 1. After this I looked and behold what? A door was opened in heaven. Amen. From a closed door to an open door. From the church age of the, the Laodicean church age to an open door in heaven. And this is where it turns. This is where you no longer read about the church from here on out. We don't find the church until we come back to rule and reign with the Lord. Why? We're not here. Why? Because the tribulation is going on. In chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trump of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, John, the Apostle John, as he was pinning this down, he come to this place where the Spirit of God on the Isle of Patmos give him all of this about the church ages. But then he says, we're going to change here, John, and, and uh, I want you to come up hither. I want you to hear and I want you to come up hither because there's a, John saw another door opening. And when he went up hither, that is a picture of the church being raptured out. Because when Christ comes back to, to rapture the church, to call his bride out, he's going to say, come up hither. And we're going to go to, the, go to be with the Lord in the air. And so that's what John is doing as a, as, a, as a picture of the rapture of the church. He says, come up hither. And of course, John was carried away. And in verse 2, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And that's what John saw immediately after he was uh, snatched out in the spirit. And as many as his spirit was carried away, that's exactly what he saw. What are we going to see when we get to heaven? What's the first thing we're going to look at when we get to heaven? I believe we're going to go to, I believe first place we'll be is at the throne of God. I believe the first thing we want to see is the, is the Jesus that died on the cross of Calvary to save us from our sins. And when we leave this world, I believe we'll go before the throne of God and we'll bow before him and say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and we'll have a time around the throne of God praising him for saving our souls from hell. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Friend, we get excited when we think about this last age of time that we're living in and waiting for the open door of the rapture of the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that we've been able to talk with clarity and, Lord, that people have understood. And I pray, dear Jesus, that you'd help us as we continue on, that we'd rightly divide the word of truth. And, God, that we'd get out of these, out of these messages, God, what you'd have us to, that will help us and encourage us in these last days that we're living in. God bless us as we go our way tonight. In Jesus' name, 